Over the past few weeks, tensions have increased between the United States and Iran. One miscalculation by either side could cause things to quickly spiral out of control. So in this episode of Learning Military, we're going to take a look at what a war with Iran could look like. I've gathered information from over 25 sources, which include government reports and publications, war game after action reports, interviews, and articles from various experts to piece together this scenario for you. So hang on tight as we take a look at what war with Iran could look like. Before I begin though, I do want to ask if you can become a patron of mine to help support what I do on this channel, please do so. In the description below, you will find a link to Patreon. Not only does it help support this channel, but because I do this as academic research for the university that I am attending right now, that will also support things like additional research opportunities and sources, textbooks, tuition, that type of stuff too. Also, since this is a YouTube channel, I do have to give the customary like, subscribe, and hit the bell icon so you can be notified when future episodes come out. Because of the level of detail that I'm going to be going into on this topic, there is going to be two parts to this, so that is a big reason why you're going to want to subscribe. Also, if there's somebody who you think might benefit from some of this information or find it interesting, please consider sharing this video. Okay, with that out of the way, let's go ahead and get to the topic of this video. And so to begin discussing how a war with Iran would play out, we need to take a look very quickly at the country itself and just uh, a few bullet points that are important to know. So after the Islamic Revolution in 1979, Iran has repeatedly called for death to America and has viewed America as a primary threat to its existence. Iran has also long sought regional supremacy in the Middle East, basically a restoration of the old Persian Empire, and it has sought to accomplish this through proxies and other means, most of which are conventional means too. Iran has invested heavily in ballistic missile production, for example, and by doing that, Iran has more ballistic missiles than any other country in the region. While Iran has been economically weakened by recent sanctions because of this ballistic missile and nuclear program, it remains ready and willing to advance its agenda and shows no sign of willing to de-escalate the current situation. Another important thing about Iran itself, and this is kind of something different than just main bullet points, is that in no way should Iran be compared to Iraq, especially when the United States and other countries invaded Iraq in 2003. For example, Iraq still had not recovered from the losses it took during the Gulf War in the early 90s, and there was a significant portion of the Iraqi populace who were ready to see Saddam Hussein fall. So make no mistake, Iran right now is in a far better position militarily and economically than Iraq was in 2003, and the populace is far more loyal to the Iranian government. Any thought to the contrary would be a significant miscalculation. Okay, so now let's get to the scenario of the war itself. Now, one particular war game that involved Iran was conducted in 2012 by the Brookings Institution. It's a research group based out of Washington, D.C. I learned about this war game through an interview that was done on NPR back in 2012 with Kenneth Pollack. For this war game, the Brookings Institution brought in a number of former senior advisors and officials. No names were actually given, but these people were to play the American side. And for the Iranians, they selected several Iranian American and American experts on Iran. Some of these simulated Iranians had government experience in the US. And while this was technically a war game, the hope was that diplomacy could prevent conflict from breaking out. And the scenario was created in a way where there could be a wide variety of different outcomes, including extremely peaceful outcomes. Without getting too deep into the scenario and how it unfolded, the important thing is to know that at almost every turn, each side would think that their move would be seen as a minimal response or a bloody nose operation and that both sides could end it right there and there would be no need for any further escalation. However, each move was perceived by the other side as crossing a red line that would require escalation on their point. So for example, at one point after things had escalated to the point where an Iranian terrorist attack takes place uh, that is described as getting as too out of hand and too big, the U.S. responds by hitting a remote Iranian Revolutionary Guards facility. The hope was that as the U.S. was going to be hitting a remote facility, this would be perceived by Iran as a minimal response. After all, it was remote. Both sides could have backed down, but Iran has said repeatedly that any attack by the U.S. would cause them to close the Strait of Hormuz. 
And so they did that, forcing the US to then escalate further. And this game ended with the US preparing to launch a massive assault against Iran. What this illustrates is how quickly events could spiral out of control and how each side has some pretty significant red lines. For example, according to Business Insider, the US has been privately warning Iran that the death of even one US service member due to Iran or one of her proxies would bring about a US military response. It brings into question with the recent tensions how far things could have escalated. For example, it was stated that Iran was ready to shoot down a Navy P-8 aircraft, which would likely kill all 35 aboard, crossing that US red line and prompting an escalation. Or the US could have launched the strikes that Trump canceled 10 minutes before they were set to start, which would have crossed Iran's red line, prompting a response from them. What is important to understand is that each side feels that they have been wronged and that they are nobly exercising restraint by not attacking the other and that any move by the other side must be responded to. In essence, things will escalate quickly. So let's play this out from here. Let's say that the airstrikes that Trump canceled did happen. What happens next? It's possible based on the war game discussed earlier that Iran does decide to close the Strait of Hormuz. Keep in mind that the Strait of Hormuz is pretty small, about 21 miles at its smallest point, and this would allow Iran to exploit what is essentially a choke point for shipping. About one third of the world's sea traded oil, almost $1.2 billion of oil a day, passes through this point. Even though an MIT study in 2009 suggested that at least 1,000 mines would be needed to close the strait and that it would take weeks for Iran to lay those mines, the rise in oil prices across the world and in the US would be damaging. Trying to clear those mines would be difficult as any ships attempting to do so would be well within the range of Iranian anti-ship missiles and air power. To neutralize that threat, the US would need to rely on air power to prevent the laying of mines or to destroy land-based anti-ship missile batteries to allow for safe passage of civilian shipping and mine clearing operations. The utilization of air power will likely not be easy at the outset. Russian-made S-300 air defense systems and other anti-air systems would necessitate the first strikes to be carried out by stealth aircraft, namely the B-2, the F-22, and the F-35. As a side note, we sent F-22s to Qatar for the first time two weeks ago. As soon as those first strikes happen is when things could get really bad. Some reports I found said at this point Iran could call on their proxies like Hezbollah, Hamas, and Houthi rebels to mount massive attacks across the Middle East. Hezbollah would likely launch thousands of missiles into Israel overwhelming the Iron Dome system and starting a massive war on that front. Iran, however, could likely attempt terrorist attacks on the Suez Canal, U.S. bases across the Middle East, and even here at home. Iran would also likely attempt and may very well succeed with several cyber attacks aimed at the U.S. homeland, like the ones they executed against Turkey's power grid in 2015, knocking out half of Turkey's power. Iran has one of the best cyber armies in the world, so you better believe that there will be some success and you will be impacted. Don't worry, the US will likely respond in kind if it doesn't strike first in cyberspace. Following those cyber attacks, those US airstrikes will turn into a full-blown air campaign, with three and likely more carrier strike groups trying to join the fight. The national interest says that the aim of such an air campaign comprising of air, cruise missiles, and of course there would be special operation forces on the ground at this time, is to try and induce regime collapse through military and economic strangulation. Targets would be military infrastructure like air, naval bases, and ballistic missile installations. We'll get back to that in a little bit. But there are some contrary reports about hitting oil installations and transport infrastructure. On the one hand, it worked to limit extremist forces in Syria and Iraq that I cannot name due to fear of instant YouTube demonetization, if that hasn't happened already. But see, this is why Patreon is important. But on the other hand, it would destroy Iran's oil industry, their economy, which would turn the civilian population even more against the US. It gets pretty complicated. But in these strikes, the Iranian Navy and Air Force would face catastrophic destruction. Throughout this campaign, without a force to counter them on the ground, most of the military of Iran would likely pull into city centers to make it harder for the US to hit their ground forces. 
They know the US will try to avoid civilian casualties, so if they can place their assets inside of towns and cities, the more protected they will be. This will force the US to rely heavily on precision weapons, which are already at low levels thanks to airstrikes on those guys in Syria and Iraq that I can't talk about or I'll get demonetized. But we're already seeing companies like Raytheon and others working at full capacity to replenish some of our munitions. That won't be enough to keep up with the estimated 1,200 strike sorties a day that Lieutenant General Dave Deptula says we will need. That equates to the level of airstrikes and sorties during Desert Storm. For comparison, the US ran 800 sorties a day against Iraq in 2003 and 10 to 50 per day against those guys who will get me demonetized. Thanks, jerks. What we will likely see with smart munitions is a rapid increase in usage at the outset of the war, followed by a major drop when stores are nearly empty. Likely, we'll see the usage raise a little bit and then plateau after other weapon systems can be brought to bear on Iran and when there are less targets that would require these munitions. As mentioned earlier, a big focus of the air campaign will be taking out Iran's ballistic and cruise missiles. One famous war game called Millennium Challenge 2002 showed the likelihood and consequences of Iran using those ballistic and cruise missiles in the event they found themselves in a use them or lose them type of scenario. In Millennium Challenge, the simulated country, representing one very similar to Iran, sunk the entire US Navy's fleet by overwhelming the fleet's air defenses and sinking a large number of ships and killing 15,000 simulated service members. The same thing could happen today. The targets of these ballistic and cruise missiles would be American carriers and US installations like air bases within range of these missiles in the Middle East. That range is pretty substantial as you can see from this image that was found at the Military Times. It's unclear how quickly Iran would go through these missiles. Likely, Iran would want to use them quickly to do as much damage to American forces in the region to impact the attitude of the US populace back home. One of the reasons why Iran wants to seek a carrier so badly isn't just for military purposes, but also if they were able to seek a carrier in one strike, the number of sailors lost would be immense, and this is hard to even speak about. But let's say Iran was able to kill the 15,000 people like what was simulated in Millennium Challenge, that would be twice as many service members killed in both Iraq and Afghanistan, but done in one day. How the American people would react to that is unknown, and this is why the head of the Islamic Revolutionary Guards Aerospace Division called carriers more of an opportunity than a threat. The sinking of even one carrier could fuel the American people to either support further escalation or it could cause them to lose confidence in the military and put an end to the conflict. It's just too hard to say which will happen. But even a hit with minor damage on a carrier could be a public relations victory, as the Military Times puts it. It would be interesting to see how much risk the Navy put on those carriers, knowing what could happen. But let's keep going with this scenario. Let's say, and that this is a real possibility, that the air campaign only emboldens Iran. The government isn't overthrown and there is no end in sight. You can even say at this point a stalemate exists. The US would have to look to ground forces to be able to come out victorious. And so with that, we're gonna end it right here because the ground campaign is going to take its own video. We've got a lot of information on what a ground campaign would look like so that's why I ask that you subscribe and hit the bell icon to come back so that way you can see how this scenario finishes out. And I hope that you've learned something so far. If you have, go ahead and hit the like button and comment and let me know what you may not have known before. That's always helpful for me to know how I need to develop these videos. Again, if you can support me through Patreon in the description below, you will find a link to Patreon. Again, that goes to help me and this channel. I really appreciate everybody's support thus far. You'll also find a link to Discord in the description as well I do have another YouTube channel and so that discord is kind of for both of these YouTube channels so if you'd like to join that join in on some of the discussions that we have about the military you are more than welcome to do that thank you for watching the learning military channel I appreciate it and as always I've got your six